We have come to seek you, O God. Just as we are, we come. We have come to be sought by you. Just as we are, we come. Show us your mercy, O Lord, show us your face. Teach us to listen. O Lord, open our hearts. We have come to seek you, O God. Just as we are, we come. We have come to be sought by you. Just as we are, we come. In all our seeking, O Lord, be our desire. In all our speaking, O Lord, be our true word. We have come to seek you, O God. Just as we are, we come. We have come to be sought by you. Just as we are, we come. A very warm welcome to Bishop Stortford Methodist Church on the web. Wherever you are in the country, you are most welcome. We're going to be using in this service previously recorded hymns. And I hope that you will be able to join in with them at home. A little bit of church news. Sadly, last week, uh, Evan, for whom we have been praying, died peacefully at home. And so we remember Rosalind and all the family. And just a couple of days ago, Rose, who was in, we've also been praying for, uh, who was in Mount Fitchett House, has also been promoted to glory. So we pray for her family too. We come to the third week in Lent, and Mike and Sue are going to lead us in our Lent liturgy. Thank you, Mike and Sue. Today, we pray for all those who struggle against injustice and exploitation. We think of those who work tirelessly to free those in bonded labor or modern day slavery. We pray that those who profit out of others' misery, like the human traffickers, might have a change of heart and that our society may be a more compassionate and just one. A whip is placed by the cross. And now we sing verses 1 and 2 of Singing the Faith. We lay our broken world in sorrow at your feet. So let us pray. God, whose temple is the whole creation, we praise you for the signs of spring, crocuses breaking through the cold earth, early morning sunshine through the clouds, and our days lengthening. We praise you that earth tells of your presence, God, whose temple is found in community, we praise you for the people around us, our families and friends, the neighbours we'd like to know more, the strangers who surprise us with kindness. We praise you that we look at others and glimpse you, God whose temple is written into our bodies. We praise you for our human bodies 
and we praise you that our bodies are a temple of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing now of that wonderful love that God has for us in the Charles Wesley hymn number 503, Love divine or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Those wonderful words, till we cast our crowns before you, lost in wonder, love and praise. So let us pray. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are wisdom in our world. You flow through creation and consciousness. Our attempts to house you in bricks and mortar are foolish. Come to us as we gather here virtually streaming from this church made to honor you lift the stones from our hearts so that we may be your church in your world your church in word and in deed amen we're going to now hear the readings appointed for today. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Mike. Our New Testament reading today is taken from 1 Corinthians 1, 
and I'm reading verses 18 to 25. Christ the power and wisdom of God. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and the Greeks desire wisdom but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Today's Gospel reading is taken from John, chapter 2, reading verses 13 to 22. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Thanks be to God. I wonder what image you have of Jesus in your mind. There was a picture by Margaret Tarrant called Lesser Brethren. Uh, you could almost subtitle it Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild, which was often shown on the walls of Sunday schools. It was an image of Christ known and loved throughout the Anglican world, but the animals, of course, the animals of the uh, context of an English countryside. And perhaps our image of Christ as we're growing up is based on that picture that Jesus was gentle, he drew the little children to him, he rebuked the disciples when they turned the children away. But how often do we think of an angry Christ? And what I wonder are your reactions to this picture of an angry Christ? 
Christ. And yet our gospel reading today, John shows us at the start of his ministry, he puts the cleansing of the temple right at the start, possibly to, so we can understand why the authorities were so agin Jesus. He shows Jesus getting really, really angry, taking a whip, making a whip out of cords. Here's one I made earlier. Window cords. I don't know what type of cords Jesus would have used. But the image of Jesus clearing the temple is a violent one. Why was he so angry? Well, a number of reasons. I can remember preaching in a a smaller church a few years back on this passage. And in that particular church, there'd been some tut-tutting about the behavior of a young child who had ADHD. And I suppose I, I tried to act out my anger using this passage about exclusion of this family. And to do that, I overturned some tables. My lay worker was quite concerned that I didn't give people enough notice about this and I might well have caused a heart attack amongst some of her older ladies. But the temple part of the temple that Jesus cleared was the part that it was allowed for Gentiles and women to enter. It was set aside for them for worship. And somehow the money changers and those people selling cattle and the sheep and the doves um, had encroached upon this. Now, it was necessary for the worship in the temple for you to change your money from the Roman coinage, which had the, which spoke about the divine Augustus, and change it into proper money that didn't have the emperor's head on. But, People were profiting from this, upping the rates. Similarly, the Old Testament sets out the different sacrifices that you need to make and that the cattle and the sheep and the doves required for those sacrifices must be pure and untainted. But somehow this trade had moved into the part of the temple that Jesus was in. And he was angry. He was angry at the exclusion of Gentiles and women from worship, the space that should have been a space to prepare people had become a marketplace. And worse than that, it had become a place of exploitation. Just imagine the scene. Jesus and his disciples going through the temple, Jesus cracking this whip, the the animals were running everywhere, there'd be children crying, the money changers would be trying to pick up all the money off the floor, the tables would be going everywhere, and the temple authorities would be livid, absolutely livid. The Jews then said to him, 
what, what sign, what authority have you got for doing this? We don't know whether the temple authorities were getting a bit of a backhander uh, from the trade, but they were furious. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And of course, they said, don't be ridiculous. You can't build a building like this temple. It took 46 years. But Jesus was talking about his body being resurrected from the dead. He was speaking of the temple of his body. And the significance of this probably only came to the disciples afterwards on reflection. I wonder whether we sometimes think too much about the church as a building and not as the body of Christ. Maybe COVID has enabled us to think about moving outside these walls but also planning for mission for when we return in person to the building that houses, that houses the church of God, the people of God. So I want to turn to the epistle now, to Paul's letter to Corinth, a divided church. And he's talking about the foolishness of the cross. Now, I wonder also whether we don't take seriously enough the fact of the cross being an instrument of torture. We are used to depictions of the cross in, in brass and gold and silver, sometimes in plain wood, but I remember a um, university challenge question where the young contestants were asked which world religion has as its symbol an instrument of torture and of course it is ours Christianity we have become so used to speaking about the cross we forget how awful it was. There's an image from Cameroon uh, called Crucifixion. And it's from the Mafa people of Northern Cameroon. And African theologians point out that the missionaries, the early missionaries, often worked in tandem with uh, the settlers who exploited the African people. And there is a context of slavery all bound up in this. Do you find this image of a black Christ offensive? Those taken in slavery were broken by their oppressors and made passive in the face of seeming defeat, just as Christ stood passive and mute before his accusers. Those of you who have used or, or, or have been in groups where you've used the images of the Christ we share uh, may be aware that there is an image within there uh, called the tortured Christ from Brazil. 
We decided not to put it up as a slide because at the end of the YouTube video it says, is this video suitable for children and young people? And this image from Brazil of torture is so shocking that I think it would take us outside the bounds of that. So we have the foolishness of the cross. How can something so awful, an instrument of torture, be good news? Well, Paul is saying that God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. In a days of hierarchical, uh, very hierarchical culture, then the idea that God would be crucified or God's son would be crucified was just most peculiar. I believe there's some ancient graffiti, Roman graffiti, um, in the dormitories of, of uh, the imperial page boys. And it portrays a crucified man with a donkey's head and a little boy with the Slogan underneath, Alex Eminos worships his God. We presume that Alex Eminos was one of these page boys who was Christian. And it was a term of abuse within Roman society that um, Romans knew Christians as donkey worshippers, as foolish, as stupid. The world order had been inverted. Strangely, there is another bit of graffiti in another room close by this donkey's head on a crucifix, which actually says, Alex Eminos is faithful. We don't know, of course, whether Alex Eminos actually put that as a reply to the donkey. But to be faithful in the light of being teased, being called stupid and foolish, is, as Paul says, wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Our gospel is about a world turned upside down. Jesus overturned the tables in the temple. He said enough. He invited everyone, young and old, vulnerable and poor, crippled and lame, to the feast. We need to be inclusive too. But most of all, I believe we need to be faithful. Like I hope little Alex Eminos was. We preach Christ crucified, yes. But we have that hope that has gone through the curtain. Jesus was raised from the dead. God did not leave him in the ground. The cross in most of our churches is empty 
to signify that. But we do need to remember the agony that our God went through for us, for our sins. And we need to be thankful and turn again to a God who loves us so deeply that Jesus went to the cross for you and for me. Amen. We're now going to come to God in prayer. When I say the words, may they serve the greater good, can you respond at home with and adapt to the changing needs of the time? In the name of the one who came to cleanse the temple, we pray for the institutions by which we organize our society, for churches and chapels and house groups, for educational establishments, for places of healing, law and order, commerce and recreation. May they serve the greater good and adapt to the changing needs of the time. In the name of the one who came to redeem the world, we pray for those institutions by which we regulate global relations, for governments and rulers, and democracies, for monarchies and dictatorships, for bodies that regulate trade, diplomacy, and the balance of peace, for environmental development and welfare organizations. May they serve the greater good and adapt to the changing needs of the time. In the name of the one who came to save us from ourselves, we pray for those institutions we have in our lives, for our friends, families and colleagues, for children and teachers returning to school, for our local communities and businesses. May they serve the greater good and adapt to the changing needs of the time. In a time of quiet before God, we name those who are on our hearts. Especially we pray for Rosalind and the family as they mourn the death of Evan. We pray for Richard and the family as they mourn the loss of Rose. We pray for Roger and Alice, for Dora who's nearing the end of her life, and for all those who are ill or in hospital. May God's light and comfort shine upon them. Amen. And so we bring all our prayers together as we say the family prayer in the traditional form. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to all who give by standing order or by sending money in, by checks, but also in gifts of time, energy and effort the gift of a listening ear to others. We have just recently been able to put onto our website some electronic means of giving. And 
you can access those via the website for the Just Giving page and also text giving. So if you are tuning in and are far away, then can I ask you to possibly prayerfully consider using those methods? Because it enables us to continue to upkeep our building so it's a home for the food bank and keep on streaming these online services. So loving God, we ask you to bless the gifts of your people, whether in kind or money, and however it is given. Help us as your people to use these gifts for your kingdom's sake. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our closing hymn is all about the justice that we as followers of Christ, walking the Jesus way, need to emulate. Number 713, show me how to stand for justice, how to work for what is right. worship has ended our service begins let us go in peace to love and serve our lord and our neighbor and may the almighty and merciful lord the father the son and the holy spirit bless us and keep us now and always amen Thank you.